Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our speaker this evening was a fallen away Southern Baptist who, as a teen, came back to faith in Christ through the witness of televangelists. During his four-year tour with the U.S. Marine Corps, Tim Staples became friends with a Marine well-versed in his Catholic faith who challenged him to study Catholicism from Catholic and historical sources. This sparked a two-year search for the truth. Immediately after his tour of duty, Tim attended Jimmy Swaggart Bible College and became a youth minister in an Assembly of God community. He was determined to prove Catholicism wrong, but he studied his way to the last place he thought he would ever end up, the Catholic Church. He converted in 1988 and spent six years in formation for the priesthood, earning a degree in philosophy and studying theology at the graduate level. Realizing that his calling was not to be a priest, Tim left the seminary in 1994 and has been working in Catholic apologetics and evangelization ever since. Director of Apologetics and Evangelization at Catholic Answers, it is a great joy to have him here again with us. Please help me in welcoming back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Tim Staples. Welcome, Tim. Good to have you with us. Great to be with you, Father. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about centering prayer, especially yoga, Eastern methods of prayer, so-called, and how they have infiltrated into the Catholic Church. And I just want to begin by way, by introduction. I do believe centering prayer in particular and the inroads of yoga and Eastern thought into Catholic, quote-unquote, spirituality is extremely dangerous and it's remarkably widespread. And while we, we, we want to, of, of course, take a balanced approach here, I don't want to pull any punches. I want us to know that uh, I believe that this is demonic stuff at its core. And I know some folks can get all, you know, in, in a huff over, you know, whether somebody's doing a stretch or something. But what I want to talk about is get to the core of the Eastern thought that has ebbed its way into the church. And as such, it's demonic in that. I mean, you think about it. Prayer for us as Catholics, as Christians, is the greatest weapon in the universe. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. This is our greatest gift. It's a gift given to us by God. And Satan knows that. If he can infiltrate into the church and affect people's prayer to impede them from effectual prayer, he has done his job. He rejoices because he can strangle the very lifeblood from the church. Now, granted, you know, God reaches souls in, in, in ways, I'm, the holy innocents who are doing what they're doing because they don't know any better. I, you know, God's grace reaches miraculously, but I'm talking about at its core, my friends, there are devastating effects on the objective level when we see what's happening in the church through this demonic infiltration, okay? What I want to do is basically I want to talk about first, I want to lay a foundation by talking about what prayer is, and I'm going to focus on the Catechism of the Catholic Church has a great section there, beginning at 2558. In fact, the whole fourth part of the Catechism is extraordinary on prayer. But in paragraphs 2558 to 2565, I want to focus on prayer as God's gift, as covenant, and as communion. Those three points. And then we're going to talk about the four essential aspects of prayer. That is prayer as praise, thanksgiving, satisfaction, and petition. By way of just laying out those seven points, we're, we're kind of going to do, you know, the, the way that bank tellers, I'm told anyway, are taught, you know, you can't learn every counterfeit, right? 
you, you could spend 100 years and you'll never learn all the counterfeits, but you can learn what a $100 bill looks like. And when you know what the real thing looks like, you can spot, you can, uh, spot the counterfeit. And I'm convinced so many Catholics, good Catholics, involved in their rosary prayer groups and such, they get hijacked. Some centering prayer person comes in and just snatches people left and right because they've never been grounded in what authentic Catholic prayer looks like. So let's start then with prayer as gift, as the catechism says. You know, it's a great quote from the little flower here in paragraph 2558 that says, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy, right? First principle, prayer is crying out to God, who is really God, and we really aren't. (laughs) Amen. This is a really basic principle that is so important, right, for us to understood. In fact, uh, St. John Damascene, the great and final father of the 8th century, says prayer is the raising of one's mind. Let's put an emphasis on that. And heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. But when we pray, do we speak from the height of our pride and will or out of the depths of a humble and contrite heart? He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is the foundation of prayer. Only when we humbly acknowledge that we do not know how we ought to pray. And that's a great quote from Romans 8, 26. We don't know how to pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us. The apostles, I immediately think of, didn't know how to pray, right? In in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, they asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. And of course, he gives us the Our Father, which we're going to look at in a little bit. For we do not know how we ought to pray. Are we ready to receive? Notice, only when we humbly acknowledge that we do not know how to pray, are we ready to receive freely the gift of prayer. Man is a beggar before God. And there's a wonderful section here referring back to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, where Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, right? The wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well where we come seeking water like that woman. And we don't always fully know in full what it is we are seeking, but there Christ comes to meet every human being. So this is a great first principle when considering what is prayer. Prayer is God's gift. It begins with humility where we acknowledge we need God, we thirst, and we don't even always fully comprehend what we even thirst, and that doesn't matter. We know that we thirst, and we come to God, and we beg him for the gift. Lord, teach us how to pray. And when, if we're there, that's a great place to be, because if we are honestly seeking God and saying, God, please teach me how to pray, Jesus will, as we see in Luke chapter 11, he comes immediately and gives them the Our Father, the five petitions there in Luke's version, Matthew's, in Matthew 6 that we use in our uh, Catholic catechism, the seven peti- petitions. But the point is that we realize, this is the first principle of prayer, as I said from the start, that God is God and we need him. We don't know how to pray. We come to God as beggars, asking him for the gift and acknowledging it is, in fact, a gift. That's point number one. And one theological aspect with regard to this before we go to point two, and that is remember, sometimes we have to beat this into Catholic heads, right? Grace can't be merited. What does that mean? Romans chapter 11, verse 6, you know, St. Paul says, a grace that can be earned or merited is no longer grace. We can never merit what we call in Catholic theology the first grace. We can merit an increase in grace once it is received, but we can never merit the first grace. This helps to keep us humble because we need to understand that we are beggars. God, please give me the grace of prayer. We all talk about how contemplation is entirely unmerited. You can never work your way up to contemplation. Well, you can never work your way up to the first grace in general. 
And that's something that we, we as Catholics tend to kind of uh, kick against the goads on because we think we can, you know, merit our, our, our way to heaven. And of course, once we receive the first grace, we, we must merit, but we can never merit the first grace. We must humbly beg God for his grace. And that keeps us humble, keeps us away from presumption. Because, you know, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, sometimes God will withhold grace as a punishment for sin. We, we can never be presumptuous when it comes to grace, but rather acknowledge, God, I need your grace. If I am going to pray, and if I'm going to persevere in prayer, I need your grace, because your grace is the first principle of the gift of prayer. So number one, prayer is a gift. Number two, prayer is a covenant. And I'm going to skip down here to paragraph 2564, because here the catechism emphasizes emphasizes that Christian prayer is a covenantal relationship between God and man. So again, first principle, prayer is a gift entirely. Grace, we cannot merit whatsoever, that first gift of grace. But secondly here, prayer is a covenantal relationship between God and man in Christ. It's the action of both God and man springing forth from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves. Now, I know this is basic stuff here, but when we get to centering prayer, you're going to see why it's so important that we understand this. Basic stuff, right? A covenantal relationship required on both ends in order for there to be a relationship. Man and God. God the first principle, but man is called to enter into that covenantal relationship, which is what what prayer is. And as such, it is the action of God and of man, as the Catechism says, springing forth from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves, wholly directed the Father, in union, here comes another key, in union with the human will of the Son of God, made man. Ultimately, prayer becomes by God's gift, you and I being incorporated into the very life of the Blessed Trinity. Through baptism, we are incorporated into and lifted up into the very life of God. But there is only one way to enter into that great mystical union, And that is through the one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, right? And the only way we can enter into that union is to join our wills with his. We must join with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 11, the beautiful and powerful text, verse 36. Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And I want to emphasize here, this is the God-man Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who says, not my will, but thy will be done. Just a moment, if I could explicate a little bit. But it's very important for us to understand that Christ's human will is real, and it's Through that human will, think about this. When the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, from the instant of our Lord's incarnation, we know from Pope Pius XII in his great encyclical, Mystici Corporis, paragraph 75, that Christ had the beatific vision from the moment of his conception. And in his very first act of being in his human nature, He merited infinitely the salvation of an infinite number of worlds. And in fact, his entire life becomes redemptive. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells you, I'll give you homework. Paragraph 517 tells us that Christ's entire life is redemptive. Beautiful, you know, that paragraph there, because it starts with 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know, Christ, though he was rich, yet he was made poor, that we might be made rich in him talking about how that even in the act of the incarnation, the first act of the human nature upon his incarnation was an act of infinite humiliation, 
where he obeys the Father and merits infinitely. And then right from the beginning, from his childhood, the, the, the catechism goes on from his childhood into his ministry years, in and through the cross, and even to the ascension in Romans 4.25. He was crucified for our sins. He was raised again for our justification. So his entire life was redemptive. But it was redemptive only because, now remember this, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin created an infinite separation between God and man. One sin against an infinitely holy God creates a chasm of infinite proportions. And in order for that chasm to be bridged, there has to be an infinite satisfaction made. But here's the problem. How can there be an infinite satisfaction made? Now, of course, God, in his omnipotence, could have saved us in any number of ways. But God chose the most sublime in that he chose to give us a sacrifice of infinite value so that justice, as the great uh, Cardinal Charles Journey says that in the incarnation, Christ turned, or God turned the world of nature into a world of redemption, because God chose a redemption. I, I like to use an analogy here in order to explain this, because again, God could have just forgiven us, but there could not have been true justice in the universe without a sacrifice that satisfies for sin. And this is what I mean by that. This is why Journey would say that, you know, God turned through Christ the world of nature into a world of redemption. If my son puts a rock through my na neighbor's house, well, and actually my son has done something close to that, you know what I do is I march my son over to the <laughs> neighbor's house and say, yes, I'm sorry, my son has something to say here, namely, he's sorry, and my son profusely apologizes. But that's not justice, right? That's not justice. The neighbor forgives him, that's great, but that's not justice. My son has to reach into his bank account, pull out some cash from his hard-earned allowance, and pay for a window to make satisfaction for what he has done and reestablish justice. Are you with me? That's justice. The first was mercy. In, in a strict sense, mercy forgiveness, but not justice in the full sense of the term. God wills for there to be justice, satisfaction. Problem is, when we're separated from God, we have that infinite chasm. How do we make satisfaction? Well, there's no sacrifice we can offer that can make satisfaction to an infinitely holy God. So where do we go? There can never be true satisfaction incoming <laughs> the incarnation. Because God, yes, he has the infinite power to forgive, but if there's going to be justice, there has to be a sacrifice. Well, God can't make a sacrifice, because in order to sacrifice, you have to overcome obstacle, some sort of obstacle. In order to merit, you have to overcome some obstacle. God can't merit in the divine nature, because there's no obstacle to overcome. Hence, the word is made flesh and dwells among us so that God in Christ can merit, overcome obstacles and offer a truly propitiatory sacrifice in and through the mediation of the human nature that can establish true satisfaction, true justice in the universe so that we sinners can have a relationship of justice with God that is beyond anything we can possibly fathom. This is what we mean by prayer as a covenant relationship, right? Now, we have a two-way relationship with God. How can that be? By virtue of the incarnation and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are lifted up into the very life of the Blessed Trinity, and you and I can offer our prayers in him, with him, and through him. 
that in a condign sense can actually be just. Now, they can't be just in a strict sense because only God, only Christ can, can offer the sacrifice to take away the sins of the world because only Christ is just by nature. Are you with me? Only Christ can offer that infinite sacrifice, but we, by entering into him, and here's the key, folks, in a real covenantal relationship, and this is why the catechism says, by joining with the human will of Christ, our wills joined with his in him can then offer our prayers and sacrifices to God, and they can truly be propitiatory in him. And we establish a relationship, not just of mercy, which, of course, mercy goes before justice. Mercy triumphs over justice. But through Christ, then, we have a real relationship, a covenantal relationship that is the foundation of our prayer. And it is a two-way relationship rooted in the human will of Christ. All right, forgive me. I could go all day on that one, but let's move to the third point the catechism makes here in paragraph 2565, prayer as communion. It's because of this reality of prayer as gift first, gift from God that transcends us infinitely. We have no power whatsoever to bring ourselves into that covenantal relationship so that we can experience the prayer that God wills us to experience. We then enter into that covenantal relationship, which is the essence of what prayer is, resulting in the third aspect of prayer, which is communion. In the New Covenant, the Catechism says in paragraph 2565, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond measure, with His Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. The grace of the kingdom is, listen to this, the union of the entire holy and royal trinity with the whole human spirit. Thus, the life of prayer is the habit of, of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and in communion with him. That communion made possible because of the gift that brings us into that covenantal relationship where now we can experience communion. A communion that is between man and God, man never ceasing to be man, God never ceasing to be God, but we are lifted up into his very life and his love, and that empowers everything that we are, everything that we do, and this is why I say that this is the most important, the greatest gift in the life of the church of Christians is the power of prayer, because this is the first principle of it. If you're going to get up tomorrow morning and do anything, It's got to begin with prayer because it is the power of prayer that is the first principle of every Christian act. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. It's the source and summit of our prayer. But if we are not praying before we receive the Eucharist, the Eucharist can become damnation for us. Amen? That's why prayer is so important And this is why, of course, the devil wants to ebb his way into the very life of the church in her prayer. Now, of course, he can't touch the prayer of the spotless bride of Christ in the Eucharist, the highest form of prayer. But he can touch your prayer and he can touch my prayer by confusing us, by lying to us, by distracting us, by getting us off of the core of what prayer is. Real quick now. I want to talk about the four aspects of prayer real quick, and then we're going to get to some of these Eastern uh, practices. Hopefully, we're, we're getting a hold of the authentic $100 bill here so that when we start getting to the counterfeit, we'll see, hey, there's a problem here. But when we talk about our prayers that we offer to God, our sacrifices that we offer to God, of, cr- of course, first and foremost, we offer a prayer of praise, Right? Cy Kellett helped me uh, to uh, remember uh, an acronym when we talk about the four kinds of prayer or sacrifices that we offer to God. He said, Tim, how about pray Tim Staples pray? And and I've, I've never forgotten that. So it's praise, right? Pray Tim Staples pray. Thanksgiving, satisfaction, and petition. The four aspects of prayer. 
the, this first aspect of prayer is the prayer of praise. We see it in the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, says Jesus, when he teaches us how to pray. Praise. We see in Psalm 22, 3, which is a, a prophetic of, uh, psalm referring to the suffering servant. If you notice in verse 3, the scripture says God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits. The RSV says uh, God dwells on the throne of his people's praises, right? Praise is power. Why? Because this is the first act of prayer. Our first motion, ordinarily speaking, when we pray should be one of praise, This is something the devil can't touch because when you start praising God, it doesn't even matter what's going on in your life. You can have a disaster going on in your life. And you know what happens? You start, you know what I say? Uh, Gentlemen, you you start experiencing some serious temptation in your life. You know what you do? Well, start praying a rosary. That helps. But start praising God. You know what happens? When you start praising Jesus, there's no room anymore. (laughs) There's no room anymore. Because praise sets demons to flight. I always think of Jericho, right? God tells the children of Israel to march. We we all know, march around seven times, around, and and sing the praises of God, which seems insane, but the walls come falling down. It's a, a very important principle. God inhabits the praises of his people. Now, of course, this praise, thanksgiving, satisfaction, and petition finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Because Christ's sacrifice is the infinite act of praise. The human nature of Christ, because of the hypostatic union, joined with the divine nature in the divine person, receives infinite dignity. And so Christ's sacrifice of praise, in fact, in John 17, you'll remember, I think it's right around verse 6, where Jesus says, Father, I have glorified you in accomplishing everything you have sent me to accomplish. What he says there is his entire life, every aspect of his human life was an act of glorification or praise of God. So the Eucharist, which is Christ, self-offering to the Father, is an infinite act of praise. And so we join our praise, exercising our human will, exercising our human will in union with Christ becomes power beyond anything we can fathom when we choose to praise God. We choose to say the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name as the angels pray, holy, holy, holy for all eternity in praise of the, of the thrice holy God. There is no demon that can come anywhere near when the praises of God are being sung, number one. Number two, thanksgiving. Now, we all know, of course, thanksgiving, Eucharisto in Greek, is what Jesus says on Holy Thursday when he institutes the Eucharist. He gives thanks, Eucharisto. The ultimate act of Eucharist or thanksgiving is the Eucharist. But in our lives, in preparation for the Eucharist, how Thank, how much thanksgiving do we express in our lives? You know, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 1 and 2 says, I exhort you therefore, brethren, first of all, that prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings, plural, be offered for kings, for authorities, and for all men. Why? Verse 4 says, because God wills all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You ever see that before? The connection between our prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings being offered to God results in salvation. Amen? Right? We're talking results in salvation, giving thanks to God. And what is thanks? What does it mean to give thanks? Of course, the Eucharist is the ultimate example of giving thanks. But giving thanks Thanks means to accept reality for what reality is and to give thanks God for it, knowing that God's plan is unfolding just as God wills it to. We can give thanks. In fact, there's two, two examples of this in, in Scripture. Jesus, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 25 down to about verse 29. Remember, Jesus says, I give thanks 
that you've hidden these mysteries from the wise and you've revealed them to babes. Why does Jesus say that? Because just before there in Matthew chapter 11, what, what was he saying to the cities surrounding? He said, woe be unto you, Chorazin. Woe be unto you, Bethsaida. Woe be unto you, oh, Capernaum. You think you're exalted to heaven? You will be cast down into hell. That's what he says. And that becomes the, okay, think of that. He just said, because if, if what you have seen had been accomplished in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth. But you are going to be cast into hell. And it's in the next breath. He says, I give thanks to thee. <laughs> Doesn't that seem a little weird? You just said these folks are going to be going to hell, and then you give thanks to God. What, what is that? Because Jesus understands thanksgiving. You know, he's God. He's pretty smart. Thanksgiving acknowledges reality for what reality is, and that it is beautiful and it is ultimately good. This is why, by the way, folks, we apologists get this question all the time. How can you rejoice being in heaven if you have loved ones in hell? You know why? Because you will rejoice in God's mercy as well as God's justice, and you will know that anyone who is in hell is there because that is where they ought to be. And God is just and God is good. He says, I give thanks that you've hidden this from the wise and revealed it to babes, referring to the apostles. And then he says, no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son. And thereby he reveals his divinity as well as the fact that he reveals to whom he wills the truth of who he is and who the father is. How about John 11, real quick? I give thanks to God that you've, all, you've heard me, and I know you've always heard me. This is in the context of the death of his friend Lazarus, where he says, I give thanks. Even though Jesus had just been weeping in verse 35, Jesus wept at the death of his son. He can say, I give thanks to God. Amen? I give thanks. Why? Because this is reality. This is God's will. It is good. It is beautiful. And yes, we weep. But even in the midst of the tears, we begin to see God's will. And we say with Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. And we can exclaim, I, th I give you thanks. And I thank that, that you heard me. And I know you always hear me. I don't pray this for my sake, but so that they may see and that they may believe, thereby revealing, of course, that Jesus has the beatific vision. He didn't have faith. He had knowledge. He's helping them to come to faith, and he's also revealing to us this awesome, awesome thing we call thanksgiving, Eucharisto, my friends. And so when we go to Mass and we join our thanksgiving with the thanksgiving of Christ, it becomes power beyond will. When we join our human wills with the human will of Jesus Christ. Satisfaction and petition. Well, satisfaction, as you know, when we come to God in prayer, we want to make up for what we've done. We know we've sinned. And yet, what can we do? Satisfaction. Father, what can I do? This is in all of our hearts, isn't it? I mean, you can think of the great prayers of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, right, where he sees God high and lifted up and immediately he says, I'm unclean. What can I do? And God touch, takes an altar and touches. Well, folks, we have a desire innate in us to do what Paul commands us to do in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you pre present your bodies living sacrifices wholly acceptable unto God. This is our desire. We want to make up for our sins. We want to give ourselves entirely, but it's entirely inadequate. It's only in him, with him, and through him that our bodies can truly become propitiatory, offered in him, with him, and through him. Oh, I got to get off that. And of course, petition. Do you know, folks, that this aspect of prayer is so powerful that Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus says this, whatsoever things you pray, when you ask, believe that you receive them and you will have them. When we are joined in our human wills with the human will of Christ, 
in and through the hypostatic union, there is nothing that we will ever ask that God won't give us. Amen? Because we are in union with his will. That's why 1 John 5, 14 says, whatsoever things we ask, if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And we know if he hears us, we have the petitions. This is the power of petition. This is why St. Paul would say in Philippians 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And then what happens? And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to unload our petitions in him, with him, and through him. And again, there's no power in this universe that can stop us. I want to focus now on some counterfeits. And the thing that kills me, folks, people are accepting counterfeits. And the counterfeits are ugly. They're not even close to the beauty of what I just was explaining to you. And we didn't even scratch the scratch on the surface of what prayer is. So let me just talk here. Three problems with this this phenomena that's going on all over the church, especially in the United States, of centering prayer and yoga and all these and other Eastern practices that have ebbed their way into the church that to me are astonishing because as I said, at the core, they're so ugly and contrary to the beauty of prayer as it's revealed by our Lord and Savior. First, I want to talk, and and I'm kind of zeroing in on centering prayer here, but the the principles are the same in various Eastern uh, sorts of uh, uh, prayer, I don't even like to call it prayer. It's more a technique than it is prayer um, that, that have ebbed their way in, into the church. But just, I want to make three quick points here. First, centering prayer and these Eastern methods of prayer have as a constitutive element a monistic view of God in relation to man. Now, real quick, monism is the belief that there's no essential distinction between the creature and the creator. In fact, Father Thomas Keating, a Trappist monk who some of you have probably read before, helped found the Centering Prayer movement in the United States and then around the world in the 1970s. He gives us what could be considered a textbook definition of monism when he describes in his own words, and I have the video in fact, you go to my website, timstaples.com. I have a, a, an article there on centering prayer, and I have the video of Father Keating who says, and I quote, he, this is his summation of the spiritual life. He says, point one, the first step of the spiritual life is the realization that there is an other, capital O. Now, by the way, that's good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Remember, we talked about what is prayer. The first uh, principle of prayer is to acknowledge, acknowledge God is God and I am not. Amen? All right. And so he, he says, first principle, the realization that there is an other, capital O. Okay, we're with you, Father. Step two, to try to become the other, still capital O. Okay. Yeah, well, we want to be in union with God. We don't want to become God. Yes, in that Athanasian Athanasian sense of being a partaker of the divine nature. Second Peter chapter one, verses three and four, catechism, paragraph 460, 460. Yeah, okay, but let's be a little careful here. Okay, but I'll give you, try to become the other, still capital O. Okay, in the sense of participation, I hope, but okay. But then comes the third and devastating point. He says, and I quote, the third principle of the spiritual life is the realization that there is no other. You and the other are one, always have been, always will be. You just think you're not. Oh boy, the central problem with this third step, folks, cannot be overstated. This is demonic. It is monism, plain and simple. Father Keating is not, by the way, speaking of theosis 
and our Eastern Catholic friends, you know, the idea, as I mentioned, being partakers of the divine nature of Second Peter chapter 1. He's talking about the realization that there is no individual at all. There is only the other God. That's demonic. Now, some are going to object, and I know that. Uh, they're going to say, well, look in the first two steps. Step Father Keating acknowledges there's an other, capital O, distinct from the self. So isn't that good? So maybe you're misrepresenting that final line there. And this is, is part of the deception, my friends. Because, in fact, in what has become Father Thomas Keating's manifesto on centering prayer, open heart, open mind, Father Keating says this, and I quote, God and our true self are not separate. Though we are not God, God and our true self are the same thing. Did you hear that? Notice. Now, is this a, a contradiction? Just in his, as in his video, Father Keating will seemingly declare plainly that there is an other and that it's not us. But then he'll say, there is no other. What's going on here? It seems contradictory, but it's not. As long as we have not attained full union, this is at the heart of the Centering Prayer movement. And Father Thomas Keating and Basil Pennington, you name it. As long as we have not attained full union with God, there will be a false self that thinks it is distinct. But when we do fully attain union, all thought of self or anything other than the absolute being who is beyond any and all labels or names will be annihilated. All that remains will be the truth of the absolute one. Anything other than the absolute one is the false self. No contradiction, my friends. The false self must be eliminated. Now, my friends, the bottom line, Vatican Council One rejects this monistic view as, as you know here, I won't read it. The Dogmatic Constitution on the Catholic Faith, Chapter 1, Paragraph 2, and in fact, Canon 3 on God, the Creator of all things. If anyone says that the substance or essence of God and that of all things are one and the same, notice, are one and the same thing, says Thomas Keating, that is heresy. That is anathema, according to uh, the First Vatican Council. Folks, the teaching of the church and reality does not square with Father Keating's notion that man and God are the same thing. All right, there's more, but let's get to number two real quick. Second error that is from the evil one, my friends, is we need to ask the question, what separates us from God? Okay, number one error, the, the heart of the spiritual life in the sinning prayer movement is realization realization of what you are, not true conversion, getting sin out of your life, but realization that you are God. Second, then we need to ask, what separates us from God? In his book, again, Open Mind, Open Heart, Father Keating tells us, and I quote, this is on page 33, the chief thing that separates us from God is the thought that we are separated from him. Did you hear that? The chief thing that separates us from God is the thought that we're separated from him. Folks, this is extremely dangerous. Why? Think about it. A scrupulous person, for example, may think he's separated from God and is not. We can have a lot of people who are unsure and, and, and think they're separated from God, but they're good Catholics. They're struggling in the spiritual life. Are you with me? We're talking about an objective reality here, not a matter of what you think may be or not. Second, sacred scripture makes it quite clear what separates us from God, and it's not what you think. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59 too, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. See Psalm 66, 18. Check out 1 John 1, 8 and 9. The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us in paragraph 1037, God predestines no one to go to hell. For this, a willing turning away from God, a mortal sin is necessary and persistence in it until the end. Mortal sin separates you from God, not you thinking that you're separated from God. 
Sin separates us from God, nothing else. But Father Keating says we're really never separated from God to begin with. We only think we are. Thus, the spiritual life, again, is not a matter of conversion in order to become something you're not, namely a saint in union with God. Rather, it's simply to realize what you always have been. This is why a, a famous Hindu uh, guru and mystic once said, the only sin is to tell someone they are a sinner. Because sin has nothing to do with anything. It's all about realization, right? And this leads to the third point. The third problem is that basically, and I hinted at this at the beginning, centering prayer isn't prayer at all. That's why I kind of, I hesitate in even saying centering prayer because it's really not prayer. It's a counterfeit. See, for Father Keating and the Syrian prayer movement, prayer is a journey to the true self, a realization that we're God. And the key for this realization must occur by the Christian emptying himself of all rational activity. He must make his mind an absolute void. But basically, what we're talking about here is not prayer at all. It's an exercise in mental gymnastics that's actually self-defeating and impossible and leads ultimately away from Christ and to despair. But in Open Mind, Open Heart, Father Keating describes the essence of this prayer. And, And by the way, folks, that's ultimately Eastern thought, whether it's karmic annihilation of the Buddhists or the Hindu on the infinite wheel of of incarnations attempting to rid yourself of all attachment. It's it's all, in essence, this, this idea of, and I quote from Father Keating, pages 73 and 74. Again, the book is called Open Mind, Open Heart. If you are aware of no thoughts, you are aware of something, and that is a thought. If at that point you can lose the awareness that you are aware of no thoughts, you will move into pure consciousness. In that state, there is no consciousness of self. This is what divine union is. There is no reflection of self. So long as you feel united with God, it cannot be full union. So long as there is a thought, it is not full union. Folks, This emptying of all thought even includes, catch this, thoughts of God, the blessed Trinity, the word of God, the mysteries of our redemption, good or evil. All thoughts must go. There is a saying in Centering Prayer. In fact, my wife and I were at the presentation at our parish. The presenter actually said this. There's a saying in the Centering Prayer movement that says 10,000 thoughts represent 10,000 opportunities to return to God. Because thought separates us from God. So any thought, you must flee, get away from, return to God, return to the void. And it's when you get to no existence whatsoever, no thought or no thought of a thought, that's union with God. I asked at the Q&A session, I said, what is the beatific vision? The Catholic Church teaches the beatific vision is when our intellects, by the power of God's grace, are so illuminated that we are able to contemplate, to know, to comprehend in accordance with the gift of grace that we have and our cooperation at the point of death. We will comprehend God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this man said, I don't believe that's what the beatific vision is. I was simply quoting (laughs) from the teachings of the Catholic Church infallibly taught. And this man said, no, the beatific vision is ultimately to disappear into God. There's no thought whatsoever. All that is, is the infinite God, my friends. Folks, this emptying of all thought, like I said, is so contrary to everything we believe as Catholic Christians and everything we are as human beings. How could Christianity get mixed up with something like this? People ask me. Well, if you go to three paragraphs down from that same page 74 of of Keating's book, he says, centering prayer is an exercise in letting go. That's all it is. It lays aside every thought. 
One touch of divine love enables you to take all the pleasures of the world and throw them in the wastebasket. Reflecting on spiritual communications diminishes them. You hear that? Reflecting on spiritual communications diminishes them. The Diamond Sutra says it all. Try to develop a mind that does not cling to anything, close quote. Folks, the Diamond Sutra is Buddhist. The goals of centering prayer, Father Thomas Keating, Father Basil Pat, uh, Pennington. No intellectual activity, no concepts, no words. Folks, that's not Christian. That's Buddhist. That's not prayer at all. Far from the traditional Catholic understanding of prayer as what we saw at the beginning, a heart-to-heart dialogue or a communication of the creature with his creator. And even more in Christ, we are lifted up into the very dialogue of the eternal persons of the blessed Trinity. And we're going to throw that away for nothing, literally. Think of this, folks. You're going to throw that away for literally nothing. Far from the traditional Catholic understanding of prayer, this is blasphemy. In fact, the Catechism of the Catholic Church expressly declares this type of prayer to be erroneous. In paragraph 2726, it says, and I quote, In the battle of prayer, we must face in ourselves and around us erroneous notions of prayer. Some people view prayer as an effort of concentration to reach a mental void. The Catechism says that is a false notion of prayer. Think about it. The Catholic Christian faith is a religion of the word. Folks, we, we only scratched on the fact that through baptism, we are incorporated into Christ, the word, lifted up into the very life of the Trinity. And in the word, we experience that communication of that infinite, simple word that is the second person of the blessed Trinity in the life of the Trinity. We enter into that and participate in that reality. In accordance, as I said, with the gift of grace we receive and our cooperation with that grace. Folks, to advocate movement away from the word is to advocate movement away from the word made flesh. If you say, as this presenter said at my parish, all words, all thoughts, all concepts, everything, including the Trinity, ultimately, now they can be kind of stepping stones, to think about, you know, about the Trinity and such, but ultimately they must go as well. Well, my friends, St. Teresa of Avila begs to disagree. In fact, in her interior castle, part one, section one, St. Teresa of Avila says, for it to be prayer at all, the mind must take part in it. Pope St. John Paul II in a homily of November 1st, 1982 said, and I quote, St. Teresa of Avila's teaching is valid even in our day against some methods of prayer which are not inspired by the gospel and which in practice tend to set Christ aside in the preference for a mental void which makes no sense in Christianity. Any method of prayer is valid insofar as it is inspired by Christ and leads to Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the word. And folks, I'll, I'll end with this. The intellect and will, my friends, are essential to our nature as human beings. Folks, we can no more detach ourselves from our intellects and wills, our thoughts, than we can detach ourselves from being human. Indeed, apart from the functioning of the human intellect and will, there can be no love, there can be no no humanity, and we all know Jesus gave us the great commandment, the greatest commandment, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven: 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. How radically different is authentic. If you look at the catechism, paragraphs 2709 to 2719, look at the catechism, the way it describes, and this is what I challenge this speaker, as well as others at, at this conference a few years ago. I said, you just give a read to the catechism, paragraph 2709 to 2719, and look at the church and the way the church teaches contemplation. Let me just quote paragraphs 27, 15, and 16. Contemplation is a gaze of faith fixed on Jesus. 
Contemplation also turns its gaze on the mysteries of the life of Christ. That means thinking, amen? As St. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, and finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. Contemplative prayer is hearing the word of God. Far from being passive, such attentiveness is the obedience of faith. It part- I'm going to end on this, folks. It participates in the yes of the Son and in the fiat of God's lowly handmade. That's prayer, my friends. It participates in the yes. When we started this presentation, Mark chapter 11, verse 36, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. I kid you not, at this presentation, I made this very point, and I said, my good, Jesus is the ultimate example of of prayer for us. He teaches us how to pray. He prayed himself, and he exemplified it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about it. He taught us how to pray, the Our Father. He exemplified it in John 17 and in the Garden of Gethsemane. (laughs) Not my will, but thy will be done. And you're going to tell me that somehow the human will must disappear and realize that there is only the divine? What in the world is that? And this presenter actually said, well, you know, the Our Father, it, Jesus gave us that prayer, but it, it's, it, and it's good for those who are new in the spiritual life. But ultimately, we have to transcend it. He really did say that. Not, not to contradict it, but we transcend it. We go deeper, and our Lord wants us to go deeper in our prayer. And I'm telling you, I just said, oh, my word, it's time for me to leave this parish. And you know what else I thought? I thought, how ugly. Because Jesus is beneath you. Jesus somehow, well, you know, Jesus, yeah, he talks about not my will, but thy will be done. But, of course, we need to transcend that and understand that our will disappears into the ultimate, which is the one God the absolute mystery, and there is no other. Folks, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 tells us when we get to heaven, you know what, Jesus, if, if you and I endure till the end, we make it to heaven, Jesus is going to give us an individual little white stone with a name on it that only you will know and he will know. And you know why John has that there? Of course, it's revealed to him by Jesus Christ. But John is writing against the Gnostics. And in fact, that's exactly the idea that the Gnostics were teaching, that we will be eliminated into the noose, no individuality. And John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us right there, no, we will be, I will be Tim Staples for all eternity, joined with Christ in eternal bliss, I pray. But I will always be Tim Staples, and I will always be able to say, I have a will, and Jesus has a will, and thanks be to God, my will now is totally in union with his. God bless you guys. Thank you so much, Mr. Seeples. That was really fantastic. All right, but let me just start with with this one. We had a few coming in, uh, Mr. Seeples. At the beginning of your talk, you were talking about this idea of the first grace. Could you explain what you meant by what is this first grace? Yes, very important. What that means is whether we talk about the first grace in the process of justification, which the Council of Trent Session 6 on justification gets into a lot of that because they were dealing with with, uh, Luther and Calvin on on the issue of justification. And what it says is, that you and I have absolutely no power whatsoever to turn ourselves toward the eternal God. No power. Without, and and we're talking pre-justification here, okay? Before baptism, you're an adult. Before you can even think of coming to Jesus Christ, God must give you what's called the first grace, which is entirely unmerited. 
We cannot merit, we can't merit it for anyone else. This is totally a, a sovereign act of God. But as Canon 4 of the Council of Trent makes clear, that first grace must be cooperated with. Now, you can't merit yet because you're not, you, you don't have sanctifying grace. But that first grace is what empowers you to be able to look up and then to either, you can either cooperate with God and go forward to the grace of justification, or you can resist, as the Council of Trent famously quotes, uh, what is it, Acts 7.55. Remember where St. Stephen says to, the, to the, the, his uh, Jewish fathers there that were about to stone him, he said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, right? So we can resist that first grace, but we can't work it up. We can cooperate with it, but we can't work it up. Once we receive that first grace, then we must cooperate. We can grow in it. We can cooperate to where it becomes effective in our life and we walk with God. We can become stronger. This is something that a lot of folks don't realize, I find, even among Catholic theologians, that, oh gosh, where is it? The, the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. You know, the one who falls on rocky ground, who has no root in himself, he endures a while and falls away. Well, in the tradition of the church, those are the ones who don't cooperate well at the outset. It's very important, even before baptism, that you cooperate with the particular graces God is giving you so that when you see baptism doesn't somehow people get the wrong idea that, well, it doesn't matter what you do before because everything's going to be forgiven and you're going to get sanctifying grace there when you're baptized. Oh yes, it does matter because it, it's dependent upon your cooperation in the, in, I'm talking about the adult convert on the way up to baptism is going to deter, determine how, how the fruits of the sacrament operate in your life. Okay, so it's important that we understand that. But once we get into Christ then, and sanctifying grace is on our soul, then we can cooperate with those graces. We can grow in grace. We can never create the first grace. Even if you fall into mortal sin, for example, you can't work your way up to receiving grace again. You have to, as the Council of Trent says, be justified again by going to confession and you receive, that is a kind of the first grace. And, and by the way, at the end of our lives, the grace of final perseverance is something that we cannot merit, right? This is why we pray every day. Folks, if you're not praying a daily rosary, you need to. <laughs> pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. We pray for that grace of final perseverance. Why? Because it's completely unmerited. We can't work our way up to it. But of course, we must cooperate. Even in the last instant of our lives, we must cooperate with that grace to make it effectual in our lives. So that's what I mean by the first grace. And so when we talk about prayer, contemplation, contemplation cannot be merited. It's not something we can work up to. That too is a kind of first grace that is given to us by God. We can cooperate with it. We're called to cooperate with it but we cannot merit that. So when I say the first grace, the first grace means the grace given by a sovereign act of God that we cannot merit. And really, that's just grace itself. This is why Paul says in Romans 11, verse 6, uh, grace that is merited is not grace at all, right? Right? you know, because grace by nature cannot be merited. However, once you enter into grace, then it's, what is it? Second Peter. Uh, oh gosh, that would be chapter three right there near the er uh, end. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can merit the increase of grace for ourselves and for others. And so, you know, it's important that we make those distinctions between the first grace. Because I'll tell you what, it, it, it breeds humility when you understand, man, you, you fall into grave sin. By the way, I don't recommend anybody commit mortal sin, just so you know. I don't recommend it. But if we commit a mortal sin, we are at the mercy of God. Now, of course, God loves us and he forgives us. He calls us to go to confession. 
but that is a a grace that first grace is something entirely absolute you are at the mercy of god you are truly the beggar at at the lord's table that we were talking about earlier when we 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 talk about the first grace and we should be beggars at the lord's table all the time as well but does that i hope that helps it's the key is the first grace whether it's before baptism whether it's after baptism we fall into mortal sin or those particular graces like final perseverance the gift of contemplation and such that god sovereignly gives to us Mm -hmm. yes yeah i think that's a really helpful answer so thank you i have a question that i'm synthesizing for many questions i think it's on many people's minds who are attending this lecture and um that is this i um there are many people it has to do with yoga so many people think of yoga um as purely just like a physical exercise. So right. not relating it to prayer at all. And then there are even groups um, that try to make it sort of like a Christian yoga focusing right. on like aspects of authentic prayer. So right. can you maybe speak on, is it possible to pull out any positive things from yoga, like the stretches or things like that? Right. Or right. is it impossible to separate it from how it was initially like came about? Right. Well, from a Catholic perspective, there is no possible way of having a sort of joint yoga Catholic spirituality. Just does not exist. That is impossible. They are antithetical. It's oil and water. But I do think we can go too far in saying that somehow the devil owns a particular posture. And I know I have friends, I have colleagues that made that argument to me, and I'm sorry, I don't buy that. That's giving the devil way too much power. Um, if you're stretching and you happen, you know, if, if somebody tells you, okay, if you stretch in this position, you're okay. But if you move here up, oh, ah, the devil's got you. No, the devil does not own a posture. I was talking with a very well-known apologist. She's actually a very good f- friend of mine. We, we don't entirely agree, but actually we don't disagree that much. But she, she is of the opinion that, no, you have to avoid that posture. And, and I say, and she said, I'll give you an example, Tim. If you flip your middle finger up at somebody, you're in, you're in a, uh, a tight situation on, on the street, and you move your finger, and you didn't mean to do it to, to uh, you know, indicate what it means on a popular level, but you just happen to do that, guess what? you're going to get yourself in trouble because that has a meaning in and of itself. And you know what I said to her? I said this, well, let me, let me just explain something to you. (laughs) Now, do you know what, do you see what I just did? I just did that. And I moved my glasses up. Now, if somebody has a problem with that, they have a problem. Okay. It's not mine because that motion is not owned by some evil sort of, you know, thing that's antithetical to, to our faith. So we don't want to go so far. And I, because I think what ends up happening, I, I give folks homework. If you look at the catechism, I believe it's paragraph 2111 and 2112 in the catechism of the Catholic church, it talks about superstition and it says superstition is the attributing to external uh, devotions and actions, spiritual efficacy apart for the necessary apart from the necessary internal dispositions that is superstition right so to attribute some kind of power to a particular stretching position is superstition we don't have to worry about that but i do uh say that um if somebody is stretching as stretching and they like particular positions that happen to be congruent with yoga and they're not doing any spirituality whatsoever that is not a sin that is not wrong but you better be very careful don't be going into yoga classes where the yoga instructor instruct instructor is in fact practicing the spirituality because then you're going into the devil's domain why would you do that that's what i say why would you want to do that? But if you've got three Christians together and you're looking at a video of particular stretches and there's no spirituality uh, at, at all, then that's not you. Know, in fact, the, the, the yoga masters that you will talk to will tell you that that's not yoga because yoga 
involves a spirituality, not just the body positions. And in fact, a lot of the body positions are relatively new in yoga as well. Does that make sense? You just, you know, be careful. Don't go to the yoga classes where they're, you, you don't even know some of these uh, instructors are into the spirituality and such. And you also have to think of the scandal it could cause. You as a Catholic being involved in something like that. So, you know, use your common sense, but don't get into superstition. That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right, Paul, I see that you have a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Mr. Staples, um, yes. Pilates, which is supposed to be yoga with, with just cutting the physical in the middle away from the paganism right. and just using that. Uh, how can someone say, okay, I can do this Pilates video. Um, I can, I need to avoid this yoga program. Um, centering prayer. Okay. It empties you um, of everything, including God, instead of making room for God's yes. grace. Don't do that. Uh, what are some ways that we can apply this with the troubles we're going to run into? Right, right. Well, I, I think the principle with regard to Pilates is, is the same. We have to use our common sense and understand that if you are doing stretches and stretches alone and there is no spirituality, there is nothing wrong with that. Because, you know, like I said, the devil doesn't own some stretching uh, positions and, and that sort of thing. But I think the spiritual takeaway that I wanted to give folks is that these counterfeits are, they're ugly, they're lame, they're weak, they're not prayer, they're not going to help you spiritually whatsoever, they're going to hurt you. That's the main thing that I, I, I wanted to get to the core, what's behind, and, and by the way, it's behind yoga, it's behind Hinduism, it's behind especially Buddhism, both Hinayana and Mahayana. And that is what is ebbing its way in, into the, the lives of Catholics. I know this all over California, all over my diocese here in San Diego. My gosh, you have more people at a lot of these centering prayer meetings than you do at rosary meetings here in Southern California. They are falling for the counterfeit. And it's such a tragedy because it's, it's logically incoherent. It's impossible to attain because you have to eliminate your humanity in order to even do it. That, that, and that's why I argue you're getting yourself into something that can lead to despair as well as all sorts of, of, of spiritual traps. And so now, you know, if you're going into yoga and these sorts of spiritualities and whatnot, don't even get started. Don't start down the road. And why would you? What we need to do is challenge our Catholic friends. You read St. Teresa of Avila, read St. John of the Cross, and see the beauty, the richness, St. Catherine of Siena, and you, you will run the other direction when you see the nonsense coming from, from, from these uh, Eastern sects ebbing their way into the church, as well as these counterfeits that are in the Catholic Church. Thank you so much. I think we we'll have time for just one more. So why don't we end okay. with Martin here? Go ahead, Martin. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Staples, thank you for your talk. Um, isn't the idea behind Buddhism uh, an annihilation of the self, which is what Centering Prayer seems to be talking about, that you actually cease to, to exist I mean, the, the, the goal is to cease to exist as an individual. Correct. Because you merge into this, you know, uh, amorphous whatever that is their aim that is not God. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the idea? Yes, it is. And it's, it's logically incoherent. The Buddhists call it, the Hinayana Buddhists call it karmic annihilation. Uh, what what uh, Father Pennington, Basil Pennington and Thomas Keating refer to it as is realization that you and the other are the same thing. And that's the heresy. Yeah. That's monism that eliminates the, the, tr the what, what is it, is it say? the false self. See, and remember in, in Keating, it's so plain and open heart, open mind. If you read that book, I recommend folks read it. Because it was when I read, I could not believe it when I first read it many years ago. I just, it, it's, it's such a counterfeit. And you think, how do people fall for this? 
But it's very tricky because he talks about the false self and the true self. The false self must be eliminated. The true self endures, but the true self is annihilated because the true self and the one are the same thing. And that's where the, you, you have the, the, that Buddhist concept of karmic annihilation. He doesn't, I've never read him call it that, but that is a descriptor of what he is describing. You and the one are the same thing. My friends, I can guarantee you this. Tim Staple, Tim Staples is not the same as the one. Because let me, if, if I'm the one, the one is really stupid. All right. If I'm, you know, it, it's metaphysically bankrupt. I mean, we can choose, just use Thomas's proofs for the existence of God to know that that's absolutely uh, absurd to argue that we can be the one. If you want or, more information, and if you want a lot of those quotes that I just gave you, check out timstaples.com. Check out the article, Centering Prayer. I give you lots of quotes there. Uh, books and such, uh, you can arm yourselves. All right, God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.